All right, everyone. Um, good evening and welcome to this virtual event from Majors and Quinn Booksellers. My name is Steph and I'm a bookseller here. For those who aren't aware, Majors and Quinn is a small independently owned bookstore here in Uptown Minneapolis. If this is your first time at one of our virtual events, welcome. We're so thrilled to have you. And if you are returning for a second or third or however many virtual event, welcome back. We really appreciate you supporting this program as we can support these amazing authors. Um, so this evening, I am so thrilled and privileged to introduce four authors for you all, which is so exciting for the sci-fi panel. Um, so let me go down and run out their intros. Um, Jenny Galaboy is an author of speculative fiction and history. She's a published short fiction. She has published short fiction under her own name and her pen name, Nora Fleischer, including a short story that is now out in fantasy and science fiction magazine. She's also published a monograph and essays about early American economics and culture. She lives in Minneapolis and with her husband and two children and works as a literary agent. A.J. Hackwith is a novelist, essayist, and author of the acclaimed Hell's Library fantasy series. She's also written sci-fi romance as Ada Harper, and her work can be found in Uncanny Magazine, on Tor.com, and several, in several anthologies. She lives in a particularly cluttered hobbit hole in the Pacific Northwest. John Appel is a longtime information security pro turned writer. He's a former U.S. Army paratrooper, historical fencer, rum enthusiast, and tabletop gamer since the Carter administration. A lifelong Marylander, he lives with his awesome wife and two fantastic adult kids in the Baltimore suburbs. Last but not least, Amber Bird is a writer, a rock star, and a sci-fi simulacrum. The author of the Peace Forger books, Gripping Near Future Sci-Fi, a published poet, the front of post-punk, post-glam band Varnish, and half of the transatlantic autistic musical duo The Companions. An autistic introvert, um, an idealist, a geek, and a dreamer who was, and still is, saved by others' art and is trying to return the favor. A lapsed actor, and yes, the model for the Elves of Deep Shadow magic card. All right, so now that I've introduced our four amazing authors, please sound off in the comments, introduce yourselves, tell us where you're tuning in from. And also, um, if you have any questions at any point during any of these readings, um, put those in the comments as well. We'll have time for a quick 15-ish minute Q&A at the end of the session. Um, I'll also be putting a link to the Majors in Quinn website where you can order any of these authors wonderful work um, we ship internationally as well as anywhere within the united states and if you order soon you will hopefully be able to get them in time for the holidays um so with that first up we're gonna hear from amber so let's do it thank you hello uh so like it says below my name and as steph said i'm amber bird uh, my book, Peace State, came out in October, but I'm going to be reading to you from the first book in the series, Peace Fire. Uh, because there are lots of spoilers, each book in the series starts where the other ended, and if I started with Peace State, there's just not a section that's spoiler free. So setting the scene, uh, it's 2050. Katya, our main character, and her friends are all hackers. A couple days ago, Katya's building, office building, got blown up with all of her co-workers in it. And the only reason that she was the sole survivor was that she got a weird message telling her to go to the parking lot. Later that same day, the bomber messaged her to say that they know who she is, including that they know what her hacker pseudonym is, her, her NIM. Um, so, but it's been a quiet couple of days and like some of the rest of us, Katya figures the best way to process her emotions is to go out dancing. And so they've gone out to a club. Uh, and I guess the one other thing is that her friend Riley uses uh, Z, Zer pronouns. So my muscles finally admitted their limits. So it must have been hours later. I leaned in to shout at Riles and Brian, I'm dancing to one more song and then I'm spent. I wanted to shed the last vestiges of negativity, to glide out on an exhausted bliss. So I danced with fast sweeping arms that cleared a space around me. 
Brian and Rye, veterans of my angry dancing moves, danced carefully within that space and seemed to be greatly amused at the disgruntled looks we were getting from those who had to move out of range. As I turned, dancing and watching the crowd, I caught sight of someone moving into our space. I was suddenly face to face with a pretty man I'd looked at once or twice on past Saturday nights. He was nice to look at and didn't seem to pay any mind to my current aggressive dance moves. But I was in no mood to be hit on. Oh, damn your timing, I thought. I started aiming my arms to press him back and shook my head. He just smiled and slipped to the side. He was a good dancer. That was part of why I'd noticed him in the past. He might convince me to change my mind about my mood. I eased back on the fervor of my dancing just a bit and gave him what I hoped was just a hint of a smile. I caught Riley grinning at me over Pretty Man's shoulder as I did that. Z had heard my opinions on Pretty Man previously. Pretty Man slid in close so that I could hear him over the music, his lips almost brushing my ear. He said, hey MK, sorry I'm late. I could hear that he was grinning, but it was like a slap to my face. MK was how I was signing messages on hacker forums these days. MK was something that only Brian and Riles should know to call me. MK was not a name anyone else should be able to pin on me. Anyone except the bomber. Oh, shit. I sensed Brian and Rye giving me and Pretty Man a little space, assuming this was me maybe having a chance at some tension-relieving sex. Shit, shit, shit. I tried to catch Riley's eye and was relieved when Z noticed and concern fell onto Z's face. I'd kept sort of dancing with Pretty because I wasn't ready for this, wasn't ready to need to choose a reaction. I felt all the fear I just danced off shoot its way up my legs and squeeze my organs with thick fingers. In a flash that seemed like it lasted for ages, I felt old defenses slide in. I was not myself. I was a character in Dune, a book I'd loved since I was a kid. And the mantra for dealing with fear from that book started to spin in my head. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. I let go of being Katya because Katya had no fucking clue what to do. I let myself become Paul Atreides, who'd overthrown a regime, ignoring that I'd had none of his physical training. Katya would have run. Katya should have run. A voice in my head was screaming at me that I was being really fucking stupid. But the delusion that was helping me keep my shit together told me that I'd regret it if I didn't catch the bomber when he was practically right in my damned arms. The delusion spurred me to really fucking stupid action. I thought I caught motion that I hoped was Riles and Brian moving in, creating a bit of a barrier between us and the other dancers coming to my rescue. After he spoke to me, as soon as I realized that this was my bomber and my delusion took over, I followed one of my dancing moves through, spinning myself a bit to the side, just enough to let me easily grab the man by the throat and then move back in. I took advantage of his proximity to push a gun into his chest as well and moved my own lips dangerously close to his ear. I think this is a conversation we ought to have somewhere a bit more private, don't you? I wished I felt as badass as I sounded. I had stopped dancing. So had a lot of people near us. I could hear my friends talking to those people over the music, surely explaining to those nearby that this was an ex-boyfriend and there wasn't a problem. He liked rough stuff. We'd used that line before. It must have made sense to most people because they went back to dancing, but kept an eye on me and the man I held. Maybe they'd get a show. They'd love that and I might like to provide it. I was riding the adrenaline that comes when you do something brave, really fucking stupid, in the face of fear. I was starting to feel cocky and angry. I once read that anger is a secondary emotion. When we feel it, it's really just there as a protection against some more vulnerable emotion we're feeling. For instance, if you're afraid because someone just blew up your workplace and you're feeling vulnerable because that same someone seems to have hunted you down, tracked you to locations they shouldn't know to find you, you might feel anger. 
You might, when face to face with them, feel nauseated that you'd previously considered making eyes with them and to cover that nausea, feel a tide of righteous anger rising in you. And by you, I mean me. I leaned in until my nose almost touched the man's nose. My jaw was hard. My teeth clenched both in anger and to stop them chattering from the fear I was covering. I was grateful he wasn't fighting this because I knew perfectly well that I wasn't half as physically strong as I was acting. This was pure adrenaline and at rage. Let's find a nice corner. That will give me two different walls to slam you against. The man's smile only wavered a bit and he let me push him backwards through the crowd towards a corner. Seeing where I was headed, Brian pushed ahead, clearing the path and clearing away anyone already leaning in the targeted corner. Riley followed, no doubt spreading assurances that this was sexual, not homicidal. In the corner, the man found himself fenced in by us. He didn't smile quite so much, but still sounded confident as he tried a joke. <laughs> Next time I'll call before I come over. No one else seemed amused. My hand was still holding his throat and I still had a gun pressed to his chest. I was doing my best to make sure I didn't look at all friendly and that neither hand started shaking. We'll start with your name and we'll keep asking questions until we're done. If you don't feel like answering one of the questions, we'll find something else to do. My tone made it clear that something else probably did not involve rainbows and puppies. I wasn't sure what it involved, but he didn't need to know that. He looked around at our three grim faces, dropped the smile and nodded. Name is fair enough. I know who you are. He paused a beat to let that sink in and pretended not to notice my hand applying a little more pressure to his throat, the gun pressed a little more firmly. He still had the nerve to try to extend a hand as if for a handshake. Hi, my name is Johnny. He gave a quick smile like you would if this were a normal situation, which it so fucking wasn't. When he realized a cheeky grin and an extended hand weren't getting a response, he put his hand down but left the grin on his face. Was it a slightly forced grin or was that my imagination? He added, my name, which you probably recognize from certain forums and conversations, is Space Godity. I did recognize the NIM. No doubt my friends did as well. This tidbit of information made things a bit less confusing. If anyone had the skills to find me, it might be him. So you found me online. We worked together online and you started trying to hunt me down IRL. Thought I'd appreciate that more than say a discreet email. As if it hadn't been obvious already, my tone made it clear that I did not appreciate this more than email, but just to make sure he got it, I railed, for fuck's sake, when someone you're interested in seems stuck in a shit job, you send flowers, not a motherfucking bomb. And to see if Katya ever takes her uh, hand off of Johnny's throat, please check out Peacefire, the first of the Peace Forger books and the rest of the series. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm John Appel, and as uh, the intro said, I'm a writer from Maryland. My debut novel, um, which is not going to show up here, with the virtual background is Assassin's Orbit, uh, which I originally pitched as uh, middle-aged women, noir competence porn in space, Battlestar Galactica meets the Golden Girls. It's not quite as funny as the Golden Girls, but I think it hits on the other points. Uh, chapter one, new. Second Landing Social Club, Alary Station, North Ring. This isn't a crime scene, Daniel. It's a slaughterhouse. Forty years as a private investigator on Alary Station hadn't prepared new Okareki for the carnage around her. She'd attended to killings before, if rarely, but tonight marked her first mass murder. She was glad to see it only through virtual reality. Her translucent, telepresent figure knelt by one of the bodies a young man she'd known for his entire life. Inside the blood-spattered room, the hovering bot serving as her proxy dropped to the level of her virtual head. She forced herself to examine the holes punched through the young man's torso. From the front, the detached investigator within her noted, 
His head lay facing towards her, eyes still open, face slack. Next to his right hand lay his stunner. He'd managed to draw at least before being cut down. Other constabulary bots ranged about the luxuriously appointed room, cataloging the plentiful evidence. The bots were the only things moving. They peeped people inside. What was left of them would never move again on their own. Another hoverbot slid into position nearby, and Detective Daniel Amoke's lean shape winked into being beside her own virtual body. It's Saeed, he asked. For formality's sake, she guessed, and the official record, Amoke had knew had known Saeed practically since birth. Not only a little less time than she had, really. New gave a reluctant nod, caught herself, then vocalized for the record. I confirm the victim's identity is Saeed Tahir, employed by Sharif Security. Her business partner's grandson and practically a brother to her own children. Her virtual form rose as she surveyed the room. Eight other bodies lay across the floor or slumped in their seats. All the victims she could see had been shot in the upper chest. Two had been shot in the head as well. Ah, the killer was trained. He wanted to be sure of his kills? Blood was everywhere, splattered across the top of the game table, the walls, the carpet, the bodies of the other victims. The great aching emptiness in her chest warred with the urge to vomit. Ah, pull it together. She took a deep breath, sent out a silent prayer to the huntress. Guide my eyes and make swift my steps, that I may find the killers. Steadier now, she looked around the lounge-turned charnel house. He was on assignment, bodyguard to the Minister for External Trade, Ida. She peered at each of the victims seated at the card table in turn. She knew Ida's face from the media feeds, but didn't see him among the dead. No, wait. She looked more closely at one of the seated victims spotted the new Horizon party emblem embroidered on the left, bre left breast of their yellow caftan. She pointed. That, this is Ida, I think. Imoki's own face stayed impassive. Unofficially, it is, he said. New stood and traced the path between Saeed's body and Ida's, trying to estimate where the shooter or shooters had stood. Saeed's form lay squarely in the path between Ida's body and where she judged the assassin's position had been. Quick steps brought her to the spot from where death had reached out to encompass everyone within the parlor. Sure enough, Saeed had managed to get between his charge and the killer. You did your job till the very end, my boy. Cold comfort for us. Why can't you identify them officially? Why did you need me to come down and ID Saeed in person, she asked. Before he could answer, the rumor faded around her abruptly replaced by the cold, dark, equipment-packed interior of one of the constabulary's little electric vans. New blinked at her seat, adjusting the transition from posh par club parlor to utilitarian service vehicle, catching her by surprise. A young woman in crime scene team coveralls swept the closed network VR trodes from New's temples, then turned to do the same for Amoke, her twist out swinging as her head bobbed. Commissioner's here, boss, the tech said as she hurriedly stuffed the trodes into a storage cubby. Emoke grimaced. Oh, that was quick. He stood up slowly, head ducked to avoid cracking it on the van's roof. I keep making these things smaller. He twisted sideways and hunched down to scoot past the bot rack. Now, this crate's nearly as old as you are, Sergeant, the tech quipped as she called up the augmented reality window that shimmered between herself and New, studied it briefly, and then waved it away. The younger woman flicked her fingers, red painted fingernails shining for a moment in the glow of the VR system lights. The rear door clicked as the lock disengaged. Emeke pushed it open, flooding the van with light, and stepped out. He turned and offered New his arm to steady herself as she stepped forth. Nodding her thanks, she wrapped her right hand around it as she clambered out of the van, feeling the firm, wiry muscles inside his tunic sleeve. He was still a fit man for all that he was her age, 64 standard, with the lean build of the football goalie he'd been in their youth. His shoulders were broad and muscular without being thick. A close-cropped fuzz of hair, perhaps a quarter centimeter long, graying now, topped his long, narrow face with his slightly crooked nose, broken decades ago. You've handed me a real flaming bucket of shit, Daniel, New said in a low voice. She glanced around, hunting for signs of the commissioner, and released Dimoke's arm. Oh, we wouldn't want Toywa thinking Daniel and I are banging again. 
Maybe she could slip away before Commissioner Toy was spotted her. She'd have to call Fafia, her business partner, Saeed's grandmother, right away. The van was parked crosswise in the normally pedestrian-only street outside the Second Landing Social Club, part of a row of modest five-level buildings sitting in one of the nicer neighborhoods of Alary Station's North Ring. Not that any of the neighborhoods on the station were bad, really. But the movers and shakers, the players, the heads of the more successful family concerns, government office officials of a certain rank, media feed stars, they all tended to cluster in neighborhoods like this one. The district lay a scant block from Adiba Park with its lake, and water, as ever, drew humans to live near it. The structures on either side of the club were the usual blend of offices, shops, and residences. A normally busy cafe, now cleared of patrons and most staff, sat across the street from the club. Two blocks spinward lay the nearest transit system station. More little vans packed the vehicular alleyway behind the club. Every ambulance in the North Ring but one, Imoke had told her. News eyes tracked along the eternally upsloping street, taking in the crowd of onlookers, and then up to the ring ceiling. North Ring kept daylight during third shift, so the louvers covering the inner surface of the ring were open, and light reflected by the giant external mirror shone through. She spotted a cluster of people up ring near the Goan Consulate. She zoomed in on one of the augmented reality sigils hovering above the mob. Oh, one-worlders. Idiots. She shook her head in disgust. A political assassination and the first mass murder on the station in decades, and the brain-bit buttonheads are protesting the Goans? Goans not even part of the Commonwealth. How does picketing their consulate affect the vote? It's 17 years since the last mass killing, Daniel said. And the first with a projectile weapon in 28. I had to look it up. His gaze flicked up towards the distant protest before returning to her. Well, where the one-worlders are concerned, I just assume they're all against all off-worlders, Commonwealth or no. He touched her arm. I'm terribly sorry to have pulled you out here at this hour. Once I realized it was Saeed, though, I thought it best to call you for identification. So that I can tell Fatya her grandson is dead instead of you. She'd had her own children late and her kids had grown up with Saeed and Fari, his sister. Oh, shit. I have to call the kids once I tell Fatya. Newt took a deep breath and pushed that task off a little longer. You were right to call, she said, looking up at his long, dark face. Still a flaming bucket of shit, she repeated. Amoke turned around, his attention drawn by a uniformed constable making emphatic, if confusing, hand gestures. It's worse than you know, he said as he took her elbow and turned trying to steer her towards the front of the van. She shook his hand off and stepped off to match the pace with him. Besides Ida, there's another political victim. She ground her teeth at being herded as well as his indirectness. This is why we only sleep together for three months a year. Out with it, man, she said in a clipped tone as she rounded the corner of the van, only to run headlong into Commissioner Toywa and her entourage. And to find out uh, if New and the Commissioner and everyone else solves the case, you'll have to pick up Assassin's Orbit. All right. I'm AJ Hackwith, in case you forgot from the introductions. And uh, The God of the Lost Words came out uh, in November. It's the final book in the Hell's Library trilogy, which revolves around the library of unwritten written books, which resides, of course, in Hell. Um, I'm picking a chapter kind of in the middle, early part of the book, um, which after raising suspicion, the librarians of the Unwritten Wing are summoned to Hell's Court to answer questioning from Malthus, who is Hell's general. Uh, so I'm going to just pick up in here from a chapter which is written from Hero's Perspective, who's one of the Unwritten books who's become one of the main characters. Um, It'll be kind of in situ if you haven't read the first two books, but you'll catch on, it's cool, but I believe you. Hell only ever operated on a now time frame. The time in the afterlife was always either now or never, whichever was the most painful. Hero didn't know why he'd hoped for otherwise. Claire was already conferring with brevity, concocting some kind of plan that would surely lead them skimming along the edge of chaos. They'll want to see both of us at a minimum. I'm going. Hero said. It was a fact. He was. He lifted his chin and dared Claire to deny it. 
Not so long ago, she would have denied the sky was blue if it fit her preferences. Miraculously, a resigned look flicked across her face instead. Claire screwed up her nose and frowned at him for a long moment before nodding. Fine then, we'll all go together. Together. A sliver of unease settled at, his, at this word. He was an excep exceptionally skilled man, humble too. But as capable as they all were, the story only seemed to go right when they were all together. It made a fierce protective streak bloom in his chest, as strong as any ambition he'd ever had. Together. All of this would be all right if he could just keep them together, the story within arm's reach. It felt like the kind of irritating, honorable rot that Rami excelled in. Hero cast a glance over his shoulder, expecting to see their angel pleased at this pronouncement. Instead, Rami's eyes were trained straight ahead as if facing a firing squad. Hero hadn't thought it possible for color to leech out of the angel's craggy, stern face, but Rami's warm olive cheeks were pale and gray as his trench coat. However, Claire said slowly, she was studying Remy too. She threw a significant glance Hero's way. He was ashamed at how long it took him to put it together. Ramiel had been cast out of heaven. Even though he had not joined with Lucifer, he had also fallen. The Watcher had took pains to differentiate himself from the demons, but he had been colleagues with infernal creatures like Malthus. He strived to regain his place in heaven, only to end up here once again. Even angels could falter when faced with past mistakes and old betrayals. Claire cleared her throat. It would be irresponsible to leave the books unguarded, wouldn't it, librarian? Brevity had been preoccupied with her preparations, but read the emotional charge of the room in a single glance. She slapped the librarian's log shut. Right, good point. Rami, could I ask you to stay? I, I, I know the damsels trust you. If it was difficult to be a villain among these heroic misfits, it was even harder to be an angelic being in hell. Ramiel shook his head as if waking himself. I, of course I can, but ma'am, you, you shouldn't go into the viper's den unprepared. I'm quite capable of handling a few bureaucratic demons myself, Claire reminded him. She made sure the fact was given time to be understood and acknowledged before relenting. In any case, brevity and hero will be there. Hero knocked his shoulder into Ramiel's. I can follow orders as well as you. That was a bold-faced lie, but he softened it when he lowered his voice. Their cheeks touched. You don't have to face them. Not today. Let me do this. As close as they were, Hero could feel the telegraph of relief and agonizing doubt flicker across Rami's face before his shoulder shoulders sat. Be careful. These demons. You're not the only one with relevant experience, Claire said gently. Besides. Hero's sword may not set things on fire, but he's capable enough with it. Such praise! Listen, if we're going to start comparing my sword to Rami's, it's only fair. Hero! He was rewarded with the way Claire's voice was the perfect frisson of reproach and scandal. Hero grinned despite himself as they departed for a meeting with Hell. The way to Hell's inner court wasn't nearly as long as Hero had thought it would be. Claire and Brevity both appeared familiar with the route down a flight of stairs, across a burnt out cathedral that opened into a field of swords, and up another flight. They came to a stop in a doorway, in a door in an empty courtyard just as remarkable as it, unremarkable as its kin. This is Hell's court of demons? Hero had thought demons had higher, higher standards. Everywhere has the potential to be part of Hell. Claire hesitated at the door, frowning at the distressingly modern brass knob. Had there been oak and knockers a moment before? Hero mistrusted changing architecture, which is why he listened when Claire began speaking low and urgent. Hell's court is a traveling one. It never convenes in the same place twice. Any place that has seen the worst of humanity has to offer, any place that has seen the worst that humanity has to offer can host Hell's court. They simply snip a pocket of time from it. The moment an orphanage is burned, war is waged, or a boardroom has voted some people not worth saving. They have a demon in their employ that can sniff that moment out of the world and use it for their own for a time. I don't know what Malthus will have chosen for this affair, but I suspect she will have chosen something upsetting. It may be useless to say it, but I need you to be on your best behavior in there. Brevity, I know you've been to court before, but that was a social call. This will be different. You're a librarian now. They will test you. I'm ready, Brevity said with only a minor pallor to her cheeks. 
Hiro could nearly see her counting her breaths in her head. Four in, four out. Practice to end in control. He admired that in the little muse. Then let's go. Claire took a stealing breath for herself and opened the door. A familiar musky scent assaulted Hero's nose the moment he crossed the threshold. His childhood had been one of rural poverty, so his first thought had been barn, an ill-kept barn at that. The smell of nervous animal was familiar, urine and sweat and the vague tang of exhaustion, but it lacked any of the fresh smells of the barn. No must from old feed, no sharp cut of green hay in the mow. It was a smell of beastly treatment, lives made sour. The ground beneath his toes was gritty concrete, however, and the lights overhead were modern and apathetic, buzzing with a hand kind of light that didn't reach the far walls. No windows broke the gloom, and the concrete walls only radiated a chill into the air. There were no animals to be seen, but metal chain link fencing rose in the center of the room, dividing the large space into square pins. Concrete would be terrible for living creatures. Hero's distant childhood reminded him analytically. Too cold, too hard on the feet. Perhaps the vague shadows he could make out on the floor were intended to be padding. When he approached the pens, the smell of urine increased. Security cameras lurched like vultures at the top of the fencing. <laughs> what is this, a cattle pen? This is some spot of great evil? Hero used his best sneer and made sure his voice carried. Yes, it is. Claire's voice was subdued. Hero followed the line of her gaze through the chain link. There were indeed some kind of cheap foam pads amid the piles of tissue thin silver fabric that reflected and scattered the cold light and fractured shadows. Nestled forgotten under the nearest pile was one small sandal, child sized. A squelched noise escaped brevity. brevity. She stepped back, edging closer to Claire. What is this place? I don't know, Claire said quietly. quietly. It's too modern to be anything from the Great War. The war. As if there ever was just one. An old voice, soft voice, gently creased with malice, reached them from the other side of the cages. Malthus stepped out of the gloom. The general of Hell's forces was deceptively matronly, gray-haired and wide-hipped in rust red leather, but the crow's feet at her eyes bracketed a sharp, cutting gaze. But you've been dead a while, Claire. I suppose this was after your time, and you've been too busy with your books. Pity you can't appreciate it. You and I have different values of appreciation, grandmother of ghosts. Still with that nickname. You can call me general here, Malthus clicked her tongue. In an instant, the title was true. She wore a dress uniform, though Hero had no hope of identifying the army. He recognized the primary color flag patched on her shoulders. Other shapes moved in the darkness, indistinct and black clad. Her, his eyes was adjusting to the gloom. A pair of ch children's underthings, soiled, was caught on the chain closest to him. The air was tangy with sweat and sick. Hero had the distinct experience had distinct experience with the possible evils conducted in the trappings of uniforms and authority. He'd led armies, worn crowns once upon a time, but this place took even his breath away. The gates on three of the pens swung open on sour hinges, one for each of them. Oh, hell no, Hero whispered with emotion. Is this really necessary, Malthus? Claire did an admirable job of sounding bored. General, Malthus' smile was chill as the cages. I'm afraid it is, girl. The last demon that called me girl is now an ornament in the arcane wing. Claire let the fact hang before stepping forward into the leftmost pin, like an idiot. Brevis, brevity followed her lead, cautiously entering into the middle pin. Hero resisted the urge to scream at them for being foolish, foolish, and worse being heroes. And then he stepped into his own. Enter Hell's Court uh, by picking up, well, picking up the first two books in the series and then finding out more in The God of Lost Words. Thank you. And now I'm muting myself. Hi, um, I'm Jenny Golliboy, and I wrote 
obviously aliens. Um, I'm going to be reading a section from uh, my novel that is set in Minneapolis, one of the few that is actually set in Minneapolis. Um, the book is about a, a professional thief and a commercial artist who uh, have to work together um, because there are a whole lot of aliens headed towards Earth and uh, they have to help them. Um, in per this particular scene, um, Adam Shapiro, the professional thief, has been recruited by Ben Nakamura of the Committee of Alien Contact, which is part of the F FBI. Um, he works as a contractor for Ben. And Adam and Ben are headed to the Minneapolis Institute of Art to, uh, to steal an alien spaceship, which is disguised as an egg-shaped sculpture in that room uh, right off the alcove. Um, if you've been there, I think you'll recognize where I've said everything. All right. So uh, as this piece starts, they have planned out the uh, theft, which is supposed to take place um, in the um, in the night when the museum is closed. Um, the planning has gone really well, a little too well for Adam, who is kind of a daredevil. The happy, excited feeling that had followed Adam ever since he and Ben had left Roswell had worn off. This was too simple. He wanted to do something a little stupid to make this all trickier. But no, he had to be reasonable. This was a job, right? At least he could swipe something from the gift shop. That would make him feel better. Behind him, Ben cleared his throat. Adam, he said softly, see those guys looking at the egg? Do you know them? Hmm, he said, looking up and moving towards the gift shop entrance, careful to stay out of view of the people Ben had indicated. He recognized one of them. With that natural bleached out streak on the back of his dark hair, he was hard to miss. They work for, Ben put his hand up like a traffic cop, stop. Okay, he wouldn't say it out loud. They worked for Fred Laskin, who'd made a ton of money as the owner of the Laskin Ice Cream Factory chain, which was the chain where all the ice cream was custom scooped to order by robots you programmed by pushing buttons. Literal buttons, not a touchpad. Adam had loved the place as a kid, but Laskin didn't care about ice cream. All of his profits went directly into his real love, which was aliens. Laskin was convinced that aliens were walking the earth, which was true, and he was going to prove it by showing the world a real-life alien artifact. Most of what he owned was movie props and garbage, but he told the world he'd acquired part of the Roswell spaceship. So Greg, Adam's former boss, had sent Adam to reclaim it, which is how he met Bleach Guy. Not met exactly, how he'd punched the bleach guy in the stomach and gotten out of Laskin's storage facility with a small chunk of burned looking meadow. Would they recognize you? asked Ben. Probably not, said Adam. I was wearing a ski mask. Ben gave him a weird look. I don't want to know, do I? Adam shrugged. It was a fake anyway. That guy will buy anything. Outside the world of ice cream robots, Laskin was kind of a meathead. You think they're stealing it now? asked Ben. In broad daylight? You're not the brightest guys, said Adam. Ben's face froze. Oh, shit. They're not going to steal it. They're going to open it. So the Ben and Adam decide to, I'm going to skip ahead a bit. Ben and Adam decide to pull the fire alarm so they can at least get everyone out of the Art Institute um, and deal with these um, meatheads trying to steal the egg sculpture. Adam doubled back to the atrium where Ben had his badge out and was trying to talk reasonably to the Laskin guys who were arguing back. And here came the security guards who were trying to get them all to leave because of the fire alarm and were not prepared to have Bleach Guy draw his gun and start screaming at them. No one in particular was paying attention to Adam, so he tried hard to look like another museum guest leaving the place, then at the last minute swerved towards Bleach Guy and got him with his taser. Bleach Guy was down. Ben was explaining to Beach, Bleach Guy's partner that she was now under arrest when a strange creaking noise came from the egg. A purplish gooey club extended from it like living jello. The security guards bolted for the front door. Smart, but not brave. Not good, said Ben, did you? But whatever he was planning to say to the woman was lost as suddenly the rest of the creature pulled out of the egg. It was huge and sticky looking, like a big purple ball of mucus. Adam. Remember where the Tatra was parked, asked Ben. What? Adam said, now? The woman held out an orange crystal, like a kid feeding an elephant at the zoo. 
A long strand of goo reached out of the ball and walloped her. She fell to the ground, hitting her head and lay still. Was Adam supposed to shoot this thing? How did you shoot mucus? Run, said Ben, and took off towards the front door. But instead of going outside, he headed up the stairs. Adam followed him. So did the angry purple alien. They ran up the hard concrete stairs. Adam tried to keep in shape, but Ben was a freaking jackrabbit, and Adam's legs were beginning to burn. Ignore it. It's got to follow us, said Ben, between gasps. If you get there first, start the car. What? thought Adam, but didn't have time to think much more. Past the old paintings. Through a narrow, narrow doorway, he didn't know if the purple alien could fit through, but it did. Glooping purple snail trails on the wall. Don't look back. Run! Ben was fast, and Adam could not have said anything if he tried. Hell, he could hardly breathe. He was going to have to spend more time on the treadmill when he got home. That was clear. Past a couple of suits of armor. Then a room of Jewish stuff. Then a big, ugly ceramic dog thing on a tiny suitcase. Adam didn't understand art. And he really didn't understand art museums. He liked them, though, generally, as long as he wasn't being chased by a giant, purple, angry snot alien. Then he thought that museums were too damn big for their own good. Ben skidded around a corner and Adam followed him. Behind them, there was a crash as the giant ceramic dog thing went down hard. He got closer to Ben on the straightaway. Then he spotted the Tatra shining like mercury. Was he going to have to hotwire the thing while dodging the blob? He hoped not. He wrestled the door open and jumped in the driver's seat. And the keys were there. He turned on the ignition and the engine caught and purred. Beautiful, beautiful. He looked in the rearview mirror. He could barely see out because it was a tiny opening with three sheets of glass. Everything back there looked purple. Ben got into the passenger seat and sat down. Drive forward, he said, fast as you can. Where? Hit the accelerator, Adam. Damn it. He was going to hit the glass case across from it at speed and ruin the car and probably break his neck. Fuck it. The engine roared. It might be old, but that engine still had all the power it needed. And as he accelerated, something blurry formed ahead of him like a heat haze. He shifted into second with a clonk, then up into the right into third. He zoomed, aiming for the blur. And as he struck it, the air changed. Foomp. He was in a hallway, and there were a bunch of people running towards the car, firing laser guns above them. Stop, yelled Ben right in his ear. Ouch. Adam hit the brakes hard, which was a freaking mistake with a rear-wheel drive car. The car began to fishtail, and Adam steered into the skid, the wall of the hallway coming up fast, and at the last minute, he yanked the wheel away. He shifted into park and turned around. Next to him, Ben was breathing hard. Behind the car, the purple snot wad was frozen stiff, and there were a bunch of people pointing laser guns at it. Or freeze rays. Alien space guns, for sure, though. He turned, off the gun, uh, he turned off the car and got out. He was no longer in the museum. It smelled like he was in an underground tunnel that had been converted to office space. Dingy white paint, nasty carpet that had seen better days, even before the tire marks. Welcome to CAC headquarters, said Ben. We're under Denver Airport. And... Oh, you can get this book. Uh, Majors and Quinn does carry it. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Sorry, jumped the gun a little bit there. No, no, no. <laughs> all right, now we're all back. Um, thank you guys all so much for those wonderful readings. Um, they're all so enthralling. I would love to pick up any of these books. Um, so before we get into the questions, well, actually, before we, there's a quick question for AJ. Um, we are in the Q and A now, folks. So if you have any questions about any of these books or any for any of these authors, um, please sound off. But to start off for AJ um, from Shannon um, says they've read the first two books in the series. Um, and while I don't necessarily want spoilers, um, is this going to be the last in the series? Is it going to be a trilogy? Is there any any chance for a fourth book? What's the what's the lowdown? <laughs> This is a completed trilogy, so it, this is going to be the last for now. I wouldn't, I would not say I would be opposed to writing more in the library universe, but this is the last completed trilogy for now. And so the books I'm working on now are not in the library world. They're brand new projects. So I have announced that I am writing a duology now that is a, a brand new project, project with new characters. So. Ooh, very exciting. 
Um, we've just got a bunch of, of thank yous in the chat. So while people maybe gather their thoughts, why don't we go around the, the circle here? And I was just kind of wondering um, if everybody could like touch on what their initial like goals were in writing each of their stories, these books, uh, maybe starting with Jenny. Hey, um, well, I, uh, it was the, the book I was trying to write. I started, so I, I've told this story before, but um, this was not the book I was, I had planned to write in 2017. I had this really uh, dark alternate history I've been planning to, to write. And I, when it, um, it was such a rotten year in so many ways, I just couldn't face it. So I, my, my goal with this book was to write something fun where people in the end do the right things and good things happen. And it's supposed to be a light, easy to read, kind of happy book. Um, and uh, hopefully I got there. So that, that was the goal. That sounds awesome and exactly like what we need right now. <laughs> um, so let's hand it off to John. Want to talk about kind of your, your goals for your story there? Yeah, uh, I've been trying to think of, I, I, I don't know that I had like a specific thing in mind. Like this is the story evolved for me. I started uh, working on this in 2016 and this was originally a sequel to a book that didn't sell. And uh, I reworked it. Um, the the big thing with this book, the the overall shape of it had um, kind of came to me, you know, it, not the whole outline, not the entirety, but like the overall arc of it came to me pretty quickly. And um, it started originally was going to be kind of a buddy cop bit, which it kind of is, but it started out with two different characters. Uh, one who we didn't get to meet in the intro, uh, Miko Ogawa. Uh, is an old another older woman. She's 64, 65 or something like that, and is a spy who's had her cover blown. And originally, she was going to be working with a much younger partner. Uh, and then New came to me. I needed to like invent a character to be a mentor to this younger character. And she just kind of popped into my head. And I have described her as Betty White space detective. Uh, she kind of popped into my head full form and pushed the other character back down <laughs> into secondary status. And it kind of then evolved into the buddy cops of older women kicking butt in the space stations and on the planet and as things explode and, and go bad. And so I kind of leaned into it then and, and was like, okay, well, let's take these people and... Um, uh, way, way back, I'll show my age here, uh, there were these stories of a retired woman who becomes a courier and then a spy for the CIA, a retired housewife called Mrs. Polifax. And they're very, very funny stories. Jenny has read them, I think. And they're very, very funny stories, hilarious. Um, I didn't go for the humor side, but like Mrs. Polifax finds herself in all kinds of weird adventures and she's turns out to be surprisingly competent. I'm like, why well, can't, I know lots of older competent women. Let's, let's have them kick some butt. Yeah. That sounds so awesome. I love the idea so much. Um, AJ, how about you? Um, <laughs> to finish the trilogy. <laughs> it was my first time um, trying to close out a trilogy. And I really, you know, well, every author does not want to disappoint readers who have enjoyed the first two books. And so I wanted to really, uh, you know, do just give everyone the satisfaction, especially the, not everyone is in the readers, but everyone has the characters, the satisfaction of a proper ending. Um, I knew about early on into the second book, exact kind of the, the closing image of where I wanted the trilogy to end. And so I think as I was writing book two and book three, I wrote book three during the early days of the pandemic. I was finishing it up during 2020, during the pandemic. And I really wanted a hopeful revolution. I wanted a hopeful end. And so I made it, I think I my goal was to make, include a lot of hope punk themes throughout the book. And yeah, I think that 
I wanted to make sure that even though there is some hard stuff that goes on with any kind of, you know, any, and there has to be stakes and there has to be risks and there has to be costs with, with any kind of big finale of a, of a trilogy to accomplish anything. There has to be stakes and sacrifice and all that, but it's not, it's not going to be a grim dark kind of fantasy that I, I write. It, it, I wanted it to be a kind of thing where even if there's stakes and there's loss and there's all this stuff that, there's still chances for love and hope and all that stuff uh, in this world because God, don't we need it? And I didn't want to be one more place where things suck <laughs> at the end. And I wanted to, yeah, I wanted a revolution where, you know, kindness wins and where hope wins and where, you know, the world can fall apart and saying I love you still matters. And that was my part. I'm my little queer family that <laughs> got made of mis misfits in hell um, could pull together and create their own world. And so that's what I wanted to end with. So that was my big part was to make sure my little found family in hell got their happy ending. I tortured them along the way, but I wanted to make sure that you know, that that was important to me. Yeah, I love that so much. Love it. Love to see the queers survive to the end. You know, it's the <laughs> best. <laughs> um, and then Amber, how about you? Uh, well, I had some of the same goals as AJ because mine is also the last in a trilogy. So again, there is that pressure. You want to make it a worthwhile trip. Um, one of my particular goals here, well, um, this is a story I've been telling myself in some form since I was 15. So I needed the payoff to be enough for 15 year old me who really needed this story. Um, I also needed to, um, I didn't do horrible things to people in Peace Fire, arguably, maybe one, but there was definitely one thing that happened where a friend messaged me and was like, just so you know, I'm mad at you about this. And I was like, oh, have faith, I promise. Like. And so I needed to sort of like show the good intentions. Um, I really wanted, especially in peace state, to center um, queer people uh, and people who are either um, non-binary or who are women. Um, and I wanted to get sort of this chosen family through in a way that felt good. Um, I feel like when I was younger, I was really into like, you know, conflict and dark endings and that sort of thing. And that is way not what my heart can handle anymore. And so I just sort of needed to show that you could sort of do this. You could save the world without having to have like, like the kind of plot lines I really hate are internal strife plot lines where people feel trapped with dealing with people they can't get away from. It just feels gross. Um, so I wanted to avoid that. And the one other thing I wanted to do is, um, and I won't like go on about this point. I know AJ's actually read some of my thoughts on this. Um, I take offense at what we have done to the concept of anti-heroes uh, because it meant one thing, the, the denotation of it is one thing, but we've gone on to be like, oh, anti-heroes, they're all, you know, like you're, they're horrible people. And I wanted a book that was, and, and I, I know I'm not alone in this because I had this whole massive conversation with another writer and I took notes about like the evolution and what an anti-hero really is if you look at definitions. And uh, so, and I think it's also kind of a hope punk thing. Like I needed to show that an anti-hero, not your common like rides in on a white horse with a crown, perfect, flawless. Your anti-hero who's not that does not have to be a jerk. It can be just like a normal person in a situation that they were like not ready for. Um, oh, and then also I needed my main character to be autistic because write yourself if you like, well, you know, not a married Sue, but like if you're not seeing yourself in the world characters who are you, put it there. So, sorry, that was a lot of goals, wasn't it? <laughs> I love it. I love all those goals. Um, I think super powerful and incredible. And you touched on something actually that comes back to another question we have in the chat um, from Ben. You said you'd been telling this story since you were 15. So Ben's question was, 
how long did each of you spend writing your books? What was the process like for you? So um, maybe going back up to the top with Jenny, if you want to start and speak about that a little bit. Sure. So um, the first, this book actually started as, I, as a theory. Oh, I have this great idea. I'm going to write a quick little novella for a national novel writing uh, month and it's going to be great. And then I'll just, uh, and then I realized, uh, and I ended up putting it uh, up, like it's a really early draft on Amazon to sell. And I thought, yeah, this isn't done. <laughs> this is not good. And and the story just kept going and going and going. Um, it So honestly, it took me something like, uh, I'm not fast. It took me like three or four years. And I think part of it is that um, looking like it's effortless for me is really hard. Um, looking like the the prose just streamed out and there was no uh, and it was easy it is not easy for me. So um, hopefully it, with more practice I'll become a faster writer because that would be super cool but I'm not there yet. Awesome thanks John how about you? Yeah so I began a and it had a different title. Assassin's Orbit is actually, I think, the fourth title for the book. Um, but it was actually surprising once my agent and I came up with it, it stuck through the publisher. Uh, I want to say, like, so I started writing the very first version, and I was actually looking for my tracking sheet that I used to keep track of, like, what I write and all that. Um, the very first earliest iterations uh, started in the summer of 2016. It was kind of like the, the initial spitballing of the plot. Um, and started writing yeah i got about ten thousand words in and somewhere in there of course is where i uh invented new and she pushed the other character out and then i put it aside because i was revising something else and working through that and so i really got started with it in i want to say late 2017 and um uh, worked on it through 2017 and 2018 and then uh the last draft that i was done uh after sending it out and uh uh AJ, I think you actually read, or you were, no, you read the earlier book. Um, uh, the last round finished up in February of 2019. And then uh, I went out and uh, went through the querying process to get an agent. And uh, uh, that happened in August of 2019. And then the, uh, went through a little bit of revision with her and then it went out for sale. And then it went through a little bit of revision um, in 2020 after, uh, Rebellion bought it. And then, uh, so, you know, about four years from start to finish, really. Wow. Yeah. Quite a process sounds like, um, mm -hmm. AJ and you've been working on a trilogy. So I imagine you've been working for a minute or two. How about you? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, cause this book was written, I was on contract for the trilogy. So, it's it's not a really a really accurate predictor of how books are written because I was on contract and so I wrote this book on contract and it was about the written I delivered it in about six months. Um, but what the the first book in the series, the library then written. Do I have that somewhere here? Have, the first book in the series, which is the library, the unwritten. Um, I wrote that the initial draft <laughs> was was actually written pretty fast. I only did the first draft in about four months. But if the thing you gotta remember is that the, the writing is the shortest part of the entire process of being published. Because <laughs> um, once you write write the book, uh, that's that is just the first part of a very long process. You're going to be so sick of that book by the time it's actually hitting the shelves because you are going to be editing it and revising it so many times yeah uh, after you you sell it even so um yeah I, I wrote the draft edited it a few times my own i took it to bible paradise where um jenny and john and i i met jenny and john we all went to the same uh, writer's workshop together uh and it was shortly after that i got my agent and i thought well got my agent no problem we're gonna i'm done with this book we're gonna sell it and, and move on and uh not quite 
it was still about, I think it was like a year after that, we fi we finally sold it to our publisher. And even then after that, there was still, I, I had revised it with my agent up till then. And then there was revisions after my publisher and all that. So yeah, there's, there's always how long it took you to write the book, but then you should please keep in mind that even after you write the book, there's going to be many months, if not years of work with editors and agents and all sorts of people if you're looking to get it published, so. So. Absolutely, yeah. It is a bear of a process. Or, I mean, I've I've only heard you are all. Thank you for going through that and putting your work out into the world. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and Amber, I kind of want to hear this story about this story you've been telling yourself. Yeah, I mean, so I guess like the thing I want to hammer home before I say how long the first draft of Peacefire took me to write is that. Um, kind of my first draft of any book I write is like a mental draft and Peace Fire had the advantage of when I was 15 I kind of started building the story and I just sort of it wasn't like it was the only one I constantly told but it was one I regularly went back to and changed to fit kind of what I needed it to be so I mentioned that only because I wrote the first draft of Peace Fire in nine days uh, um, and it's just because of the way my brain, my brain works, like I get artistic flow and autistic focus. And, um, I, I don't really write well, like, like typical writers write in like the evenings after their day job or tiny bits and pieces. And my brain won't do that. So what happens is I have to set aside a week or two weeks to like put a whole draft out. And once that first draft is out, the revising is, is a, is a faster process for me. Like I can do that in small chunks or I can, you know, like do a revision in, you know, like five to seven days as opposed to needing two weeks. Um, but my first drafts tend to get done in nine to 14 days. But then again, like, like Amanda said, like then there's revising and there's revising and there's revising and then a beta reader and then revising. And so like, I, I am, like when I say nine days, those of you out there who want to be writers, don't die. <laughs> Cause it's a word vomit first draft that I've already told myself like innumerable times. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, looking at the clock, that's about all the time we have this evening. I wish I could, you know, we could sit and chat for another hour still. Um, but if any of you guys have any, you know, closing remarks, anything, last things you want to say, um, I'm going to open up the floor to you before I wrap it up. Well, I just want to say thanks, Majors and Quinn, for hosting us. You guys are great. And uh, if you're ever in Minneapolis, really, really, really worth a visit. Um, and and thanks to the uh, thanks, everybody, for coming and reading. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. Thanks to Majors and Quinn. Thanks, uh, thanks Jenny for inviting me on board. Thanks to everyone who watched and who commented. And we're sorry we didn't get to your questions. Yes, and thank you to the readers. You're why we can keep on telling stories. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, just echoing what all the others have said. They <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. All righty. So again, I put that. Uh, the link to our website uh, in the chat. So if you'd like to purchase any of the books that were read from this evening or any of their previous works, you can do that there. Um, and if you know anybody who wanted to watch the stream but wasn't able to, if you came in halfway through and missed something or another, um, this stream will stay up on our YouTube page. So Majors and Quinn at youtube.com. Um, Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, John. Thank you, Amber, so much for this incredible evening. I've had such a lovely time. And thank you to everybody who came and viewed and sat with us and listened. Um, it's just been such a lovely evening. So I hope everyone's evening continues to be lovely or afternoon or morning. I'm not sure where it's you are evening. in the world. All right. Yeah. Even West Coast, we're evening. So you're good with evening. We're just blanket <laughs> evening. Blanket evening. Have a lovely one. Um, See you next time, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay warm. Oh, my God.